morning, church. It's a wonderful day, once again, as we come together and worship our Lord and Savior. And uh, we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And we stand in awe of our God. So this morning, um, we will be talking about one of the most uh, uttered words there is. And it is called the word Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, we always say the word Amen. So in the... In the International Standard uh, Bible Encyclopedia, the Hebrew word Amen means truly or verily. Amen can be equated with steadiness, trustworthiness, and truth. And in the Lexham Bible Dictionary states, Amen is a Hebrew word that has served as a declaration of affirmation and as the closing exclamation of uh, agreement to a doxology or prayer in Jewish and Christian liturgy. Now, in both definitions from the ISB and the Lexham Bible Dictionary, uh, whenever we say amen, uh, whether at the end or at the middle, we affirm the truthfulness and firmly believe in what was said before God. Okay. Now, uh, amen, a Hebrew term, again, it says verily or truly, amen. Now, at the, at the end of sentences, maybe paraphrase by, so let it be. So the word amen also means so let it be. It also says as an emphasis marker, introduces a statement that is essential in interpreting the overall passage. In the Greek word, it is alethos, or another Greek word, aletheia. It means truly, really, certainly, surely, and uh, demonstrably valid and therefore genuine, reflecting the true reality. Now, we often use the word amen at the end of a prayer, just like what we had a while ago, or at the, at the end of a song. Okay, uh, It is a statement declaring our affirmation for all that was said. Okay. That's why we said we say amen, so let it be. No, let it be so. I mean. Now a question. Can we use the word amen at the start of the speech or the start of a prayer, start of a song? Okay. Can we use amen? I've been asked uh, this question a lot of times. Now to answer that, I want all of us to notice the words again as an emphasis marker the word amen it says in the definition as an emphasis marker that introduces a statement of fabotal importance that is essential interpreting the overall passage now emphasis marker meaning you put it in front to mark Okay, so therefore, amen can therefore be used at the beginning. Now, Jesus uh, used amen at the beginning of his statement, okay? thus making an emphasis the essentiality of what is to be said. Okay? Now, we can see that in John chapter 3, verse 3, when Jesus Christ was talking to Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In the English Standard Version, it says, Truly, truly. 
Now remember again, the word amen means verily, means truly, the truth. Now in Dewey Rams Bible, it says, amen, amen. I say to thee, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So therefore, amen can be used at the beginning of a sentence. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that it can only be used at the end because we are so accustomed in using the word amen at the end. But it can be used, as Jesus Christ illustrated to us, it can be used in the, the start of his sentence. Now, in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, okay, let's go back. Oh, sorry. In Revelation 3, 14, Jesus is called the Amen. Okay. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the Amen. And who is that? The faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. It was pertaining to Jesus Christ. Okay. In John chapter 17, 7 verse 18, and John chapter 14 verse 6, why he was called Amen? Because Amen again is truth. In John 7, 18, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is the man of what? A man of truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus answered, I am the way and what? The truth. So that's why in Revelation, he was called the Amen. Now, the lesson is not about Amen. <laughs> I am emphasizing this word Amen because I want all of us to truly know the message behind this word. It is not just we say amen as a response when somebody say amen. Amen? Amen. No. It's not just only a response to that. No. Or a response to prayer. If we don't understand what's being said, then our amen would be useless. Again, because amen meaning you agree to the truthfulness of what was said. And you are saying to God, let it be so. Now Paul, talking about orderliness in, in the church, said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 16. He says, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving thanks, since he does not understand what you say? So that is why when we do, for example, a corporate prayer, now we must be heard by everybody because it is a corporate prayer. We must be heard by everybody so that everybody can say, Amen. Okay? Now, when we say Amen to a prayer, we believe in the power of prayer. Okay? That it will be so, as we declared it. We also believe in God. When we say amen, we believe in God, that he is all powerful. Okay? The, the source of everything, the source of our joy, the source of our strength, our salvation, and the source of our healing. Now, I will say amen because I believe. You will say amen because you believe in the living God. I will say amen because Jesus is amen. Now, if you don't believe in God, by all means, don't say amen. If you don't believe what's being said, don't say amen. Your amen will be useless because you don't believe in anything that was said. Now, if you believe in God, if you believe in the power of God, to heal you. If you believe in the power of God to deliver you from your sin, I want everybody to say amen. amen. I want everybody to say amen. amen. Amen to that. Amen to that. Amen. We shout amen because we believe in the power of God. Don't be shy about it. Declare it. If you believe in the power of God that he, can, he will save you, if you believe in the, in the blood of Jesus Christ that it will cleanse you, if you believe in God that he will heal you, then everybody say amen. Amen, amen to that. Amen to that. Now, with that said, 
we will see the power of a man working in our lives. In difficult times, how to handle life. How to handle life. Number one, agree with God. Agree with God. Agreeing with God means that we reconcile ourselves. We align our thinking with God based on the truthfulness. You see? Because of the amen. Because of the truth. The truthfulness of His word. And finding solace and hope in the process in that word of God. Okay. Now, we are saying, Amen. Lord, I agree. Lord, I agree. If you have problems in your life, whatever that is, agree with God. When God says something, we have two choices. Either you accept it or you reject it. There's no in-between. There's only two choices. Okay? Agree with God or disagree with God. Now, a true servant will always agree with God. Agreeing with God is not making any friction with God. Or it's not making any excuses with God. Agreeing with God is the first stage of having a meaningful life even in difficult times. If you agree with God, then you will find your life more meaningful. Agreeing with God is saying amen to him because he is who he says he is. That he is God. A God, a God that never changes according to Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Job chapter 22, verse 21, Job said, agree. In other translation, reconcile. Agree with God and be at peace. Thereby God will come to you. Now, coming, coming from a man who lost everything. All right? Job lost everything. Coming from a man who lost everything in an instant. And having learned the true meaning of agreeing with God. You see, he said, agree with God and you will have peace at the end. So no doubt, no doubt. Okay. In the process, Job questioned God. But his questions, his arguments, and his conversations with God were never meant to curse God. Were never meant to fight with God. You see, Job never lost his faith in God in the process. Now we are even told in Job chapter 1 that Job did not sin or charge God with any wrongdoing. You see? Now, in difficult times, my dear brethren and friends, we may struggle. We may struggle and uh, to make sense of what's, what's going on, what's happening in our lives. Now, our mind gets so distorted because of the problems, because of the pain that we are having, that we forget about the truth about God. Sometimes our mind, because of the pain that we are going through, we forget about the truth of His Word. Now, Job said, agree, reconcile with God. Be at one with God. Align your mindset with God. Now, go back to what you have learned. Go back to what you've known. What you have learned about God and life. And stand on that ground. Stand on your faith. Stand on your faith. Agree with God, number one. Agree that you need God. When you agree with God, agree that you need Him. John 6, 67, 68, Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to live? Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. When many of Jesus' disciples left Him, He turned to the twelve and asked the twelve, Are you going to live as well? Are you going to leave me? Then Peter stood up and then he said, no. Where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. Now, do you see what Peter was telling Jesus here 
in his conversation Jesus with Jesus Christ. He cannot afford, Peter cannot afford to live his life without Jesus. He needed Jesus in his life. You see, in, in, in his conversation with Jesus Christ, he needs Jesus in his life every single day. Peter needs Jesus every moment of his life. That's why Jesus said, Lord, to whom should we go? Where can I go, Lord? I need you. You have the words of eternal life. See, now Peter and the rest, for them, Jesus is the life. In, in John eleven twenty five, 25, if you have your Bibles with you, Jesus said to her, to Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. So Jesus is the life. That's why Peter said to Jesus, I cannot live without you. You have the words of life. Now, Jeremiah prayed for Israel. At one point, Jeremiah prayed for Israel because of their sins of abandoning God and turning to idols. Now, the Israelites, they thought uh, there's no need for God. But Jeremiah, he prayed for deliverance and healing because he knew that only God could truly save and heal them and no other. There was a need for God. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away will be written in the dust. For they have abandoned the Lord, the foundation of the living water. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are my praise. Agree that you need God. Agree that life can be difficult. Agree that life can be difficult. Now, this verse in John chapter 16, 33, is one of the most profound uh, verse in the Bible that talks about the reality of life. Okay? Now, it was even spoken by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, suffering and pain, my, my dear brethren and friends, are part of man's life. Newborns, the middle age, the elder, elderly, they are not exempted from all this pain. No. But here's the good news. The good news is there. It says, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And that is the good news. That no matter what difficulties you are in right now, you have a great ally in Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Amen to that. See, and soon the victory will be yours. Okay. Now, another verse in Proverbs chapter 24, verse 10. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Now, this principle gives us, uh, as believers, that we need to be ready. That you and I, we need to be ready. We need to be strong when difficulties come at us. Because you know, you agree that life can somehow be difficult. That life can somehow, it's not a walk in the park. So you must be ready. You must have the strength. It must not break our faith with God when difficulties comes into your life. We must not lose our grip with God when we are pressured because of difficulties in life. Now remember Jesus Christ, when he prayed, he went to the garden. He went to the garden alone and he prayed to God. And he asked God, Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me. But not my will, but yours be done. And then guess what? An angel from God, from heaven, came down and comforted our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the angel gave him his strength. That's the goal. That should be our goal. To ask God for comfort when it will be uncomfortable to us. 
to ask God for stamina when we are so weak and to ask God for strength to endure the pain until such time he fulfilled his purpose in all of us. See, Jesus endured the pain. He endured the cross to fulfill all that was prophesied because God gave him strength to endure it. You see, Christian maturity is not asking God for a pain-free life. That would be impossible, as we have seen. But rather, asking God to endure the pain when it comes. We should ask God for strength. We should ask God for comfort, for endurance. Now, then Job said, then Job said again, going back to Job, he said, and you will have peace. Thereby, good will come. Okay. Now, let me ask this question. What can complaining do to us? What can fighting against God do to us? I remember Gamaliel once said to the people, if these people, referring to the apostles, if they are from God, then you are fighting not with them, not against them, but you are fighting against God. See? Having a difficult time, if we keep on complaining, if we keep on fighting against God, what will that do to us? Will it make the pain go away? Will it make your life easier? Will it, will it make you better? Not at all. Not at all. Now, if we live by the word of God, we will have peace because God will give it to us. And then God said, and good, and good awaits us. Now, remember Job. Job didn't know what God was planning for him, he didn't know. He doesn't have any idea what's at the end. Okay. Then he found out when he crossed the bridge. More blessings from God. More blessings from God. Agree that God has a better plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11. Now, brethren and friends, let, let the word of God Stand true. Let the word of God be true forever. Now, if you will give up your life to God completely, without any doubt, and faithfully serve him, now he has this for you. Jeremiah 20 and 11. Let's break that down. For I know the plans I have for you. You see, God has a concrete plan for you. A concrete plan for you. Not something abstract. Not something that you cannot decipher. Something that is concrete. Now God has a clear picture of his plan for you. Not imaginary. If God, it is God's faithfulness to his people. You see, God's faithfulness to his people. When God made this promise, it was not promised to everybody. But specifically to the nation of the Israelites exiled in Babylon. Okay. God made a promise to them to bring them out from exile. Now, also, the believers today, God has certain promise to all the believers alone. For example, salvation. God gave Jesus Christ for everybody, but only those who will truly believe and accept the Lord, be faithful until the end, then salvation is theirs. Okay. God is faithful and he will remember that promise to you. That's why it is God's faithfulness to his people. And then it says in Jeremiah 20 and 11, it declares by whom? Declares by God. It means the one making the declaration is the truth. He will never lie. Therefore, you can trust in his promise. And then it goes on to say, plans to prosper you 
and not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Amen to that. I love this part. I love this part. God is giving me a future. God is giving me a hope. And so it, God is giving also that to you. This is God's master plan for all of his people. Now let us try to see the big picture. Let us try to see the big picture and try to apply the truths in our lives. When God promised deliverance and restoration to the Jewish nation exiled in, in Babylon, many Jews in exile did not see the fulfillment of the promise. They died. Now, just like Canaan, many did not see the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, God in general, he never really identified who will enter and who will not enter the promised land. Oh, you will enter, you will enter, you will enter, you know. God never did that. But it was a general promise to the nation of Israel. But God, ever true to his promise, made the nation prosperous. It made the Israelites prosperous. And it made the Hebrew nation a great nation that no one can harm without God's permission. Now, in the same way, for all of us Christians, true believers of God today, now we are suffering in this world. As we suffer in this world, God promises prosperity. There will be future. There will be hope for everybody. And God knows what's the best for you. I still remember, I keep on saying, mothers knows best. But God knows the bestest. <laughs> if your wife knows what's the best for you, then God knows what's the bestest. <laughs> right? So, He never lies. And He knows what lies ahead of every one of us. Now, all we can see right now is superficial. All we can see right now is just the door. We cannot see behind what's in or at the side of the door. But God can see what lies behind those doors. God can see what lies ahead of you. You just need to trust in God. Just like Job finds out later in his life. Now remember this, my dear brethren and friends. Even if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, I want you to remember this. You will still have difficulties. Amen to that. You will still have difficulties in life. And at the same time, you will still have the same problem that you are facing right now. Even without God, you will still have the same problem. The only difference between having God and having God and not having God and having God is those who do not have God, they don't have any future. They don't have any hope. But those like you and I, that you have God in your life, you have hope and you have a future. Amen. That's what makes the difference. You see? That's what makes the difference. Now, I would, I would gladly suffer with the future and hope with God rather than suffer without any future and hope. I would suffer having with God than suffer without God. Agree that prosperity, meaning no harm, a great future and hope that God planned for you and me as faithful servants will be fully realized after this life is over. That there would be prosperity. Job 22, 22, Job said, receive. When you agree, you receive. You are receiving, you are listening. Receive, listen. Instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. When you agree, you are putting the words of God not only into your mind, but into your heart, into your whole being. You receive, you listen, and you put that 
into your being. Agreeing with God comes from agreeing and putting into your heart God's word. It is by listening. It is by living out the word of God every day in our lives that we can truly understand him and therefore agree with him and live a good life even in difficult times. Number two, after agreeing with God, you move with God. Isaiah 30, 20, 21. It says, especially in 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now, this verse tells about the assurance that we have as God's children. As God's children and the ever presence of God in our lives, especially in difficult times. He is teaching us and guiding us towards the path of life, the real path of life that leads to righteousness. Now, in reference to Judah, at one point when Judah was prosperous, their hearts were, were callous and they would not listen to God. Now the Lord gave them the bread of what? The bread of adversity and the water of affliction because they're not listening to God. But because of God's love, God has not abandoned them. But because of God's love, God was still there with them, listening to them. They can still hear and listen to the teacher, which is God, where God showed them what they've been doing wrong so that they can turn away from their sins and move back to God. Now, we can take a refuge in these facts that God remains active and present in our lives until today. Now, in difficult times, my dear brothers and sisters, to ease our burden, we need to move with God. Okay? Now, you already agree with God. You already agree to the truthfulness of the Word of God. Your mind and your whole being already reconciled with God. Now, it's time for us to act, to act on that revealed truth. To move with that revealed truth. It is time to move with God wherever God would love us to be or would like, like us to be. It's time for the doing part. We must do what God tells us to do. Now verse 21 of Isaiah chapter 30, uh, 20, chapter 30 verse 21. It says, when you hear his voice, this is the way we should walk in it whether you turn to the right you turn to the left god is telling you you walk in this way that i'm telling you just like god as a good shepherd our good shepherd he is leading the sheep to where there is water to where there is grass to where there is prosperity wherever god wants to bring us then follow god follow god and move with God. If you agree that you need God, then you need to move your life with God. Because God, He doesn't want you to be stuck in that mud, in that pit of sin, in that pit of slavery where Satan is ruling your life. God wants, you, wants to take you out of that pit of that mud and bring you and give you to that never-ending happiness with him, and that is in heaven. Moses moved with God. Remember, Moses moved with God. When God called Moses, when he encountered God in Mount Sinai, the burning bush, to lead the people out of Egypt, after much deliberation with God, Moses moved with God, wherever God leads him the israelites the israelites when god through moses asked them to leave egypt they all move with god they all move with god now peter <clears throat> at the same time peter went in prison an angel of the lord came to him okay, <clears throat> went to him and rescued him 
and told him what exactly to do. You see, the angel struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Hurry, get up, the angel said, and the chains fell off Peter's hands. Then the angel told him, get dressed. Peter, get dressed. Put on your sandals. Peter, put on the sandals. Peter did. Put on your coat. <laughs> he did. And he followed the angels. Peter did what exactly the angels told him to do. He moved with God. You see, these are people that move with God and any and many other people. In our scripture reading, Ananias, in, in verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on a straight street and ask for a man named Tarsus, named Saul, for he is praying. Then verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, for this man is my chosen instrument. In verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. So Ananias, <coughs> when he was told by God to go, he went, he moved with God. After agreeing with God, my dear brothers and sisters and friends, you must move with God. Don't be stuck there sitting. Don't be stuck there standing. You just, Lord, I agree with you. <coughs> but when God said, you have to move, no, I will not move. How can that be? When God said move, then you better move. You better go where God wants you to be. Move with God. Don't be sitting here. Don't be standing there. You move. You go where the souls, where the lost souls are. You move with God. Do not confuse motion and progress. A rocking horse keeps moving but does not make any progress. Now, moving with God means growing in knowledge, advancing in maturity, and progressing in our Christianity. So don't confuse motion with progress. Because once, because God wants you to progress. God wants you to be mature. Don't be like a rocking horse. Now, I have a friend. Um... He was paralyzed and uh, he was in a wheelchair for so many years. Okay? And when he was uh, put in the wheelchair, his life came down crashing before him and he doesn't want to leave. He wants to die. And then uh, in the event of his life in that wheelchair, he found the Lord. And then he was used by God. He was uh, ministering to the youth wherever he go in the streets. He was always in the streets, ministering to people, ministering to the youth, telling him his life before and his life now with God. Before he had everything. He had everything. He had friends. But when he was put and humbled by God, he lost his friends. Now, you can tell uh, who your friends are <laughs> when you are in dire, <laughs> when you hit rock bottom, right? But he found the meaning of life, the beauty in living. Now, he was once asked hypothetically if what would, uh, if he would return back, if God would give him a second chance in life, uh, what life would he like to return to? His former life or his life in a wheelchair? He chose his life in a wheelchair because his life in a wheelchair, there's God. And there is God. And, um, and, and because of what happened to him, when he found the Lord, he found more beauty in life. He wants to keep on living. And he wants to keep on uh, living every day, being awake every day, because he wants to go out and he wants to share his life, the message of the Lord in his life. See? Before they want their life to be over with, now they want to live every day because they are making a difference in other people's lives because these people like you you are moving with god they see now the beauty of life because of jesus is what makes it beautiful your life your life is beautiful today 
It's not because of you. It's because of Jesus. That's what makes my life beautiful. And that's what makes me handsome every day. <laughs> right, Brother Charles? Brother Derek? <laughs> now, don't be doubting me, come on. <laughs> don't be, uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. You see, and that's what makes you beautiful. It's Jesus living in you. That's what makes us beautiful. Now, brethren and friends, life is beautiful with God. Amen to that. Amen to that. Life will have difficulties. You will have problems. I have my problems. I have my challenges. But take heart. God is always with you. Amen to that. God is always with you. God is always with me. I'm always happy. Because God is always with me. Now to handle life's challenges, agree with God. Then as you agree with God, move with God. It is our faith in action. Then you will soon find out life's meaning and life's is. Life is beautiful. Now, finally, I will leave all of us with these final words. It is always better to be uncomfortable and in tune with God than to be comfortable and in enmity with God. This is the part one. So better be here next Sunday for the next part. <laughs> part two. So in life difficulties, my dear brothers, sisters, and friends, agree with God. Don't ever fight with God. Then move along with God. For those that have not yet accepted the Lord, be one with God. I encourage you to accept the Lord, repent of your sins, be baptized, and be one with God and receive all the blessings all that it's in the Bible the blessings that's written in the Bible you will receive that eventually God bless us all good morning so we all stand as we sing the song of invitation